the Evolution Security Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, we are excited to give away another Tinacore holster. There are two ways to win. One, go to evosec.org, that's E-V-O-S-E-C dot O-R-G, and look for the pop-up or the hot button at the bottom of the screen to enter your email for our newsletter. Two, go to our Instagram at evosecusa and find the Jeff Mao episode post, like the post, Follow us and tag a friend in the comments. You can use either method to enter or can use both. You can tag as many people as you like on Instagram. This will increase your odds of winning. Make sure you are subscribed to our podcast and ask a friend to subscribe and follow us as well. We will draw a random winner on 29 May. Join the EvoSec crew and possibly get a Velo 4 or one of your choice. This podcast is brought to you in part by Tenacore. Tenacore is a gear manufacturing company building equipment that works. They have a law enforcement background and self-select into the hardest of training. Try their Velo 4 AIWB holster. All of the EvoSec crew use this holster daily. Find them at Tenacore.com. That's T-E-N-I-C-O-R.com. Use EvoSec for a 10% off at checkout. Again, the code EVOSEC, E-V-O-S-E-C, for 10% off at checkout. We have also recently partnered with Origin USA. Origin is a lifestyle company making jujitsu gis, rash guards, boots, and jeans, and producing world-class supplements. They use cotton grown in the USA, woven on their looms, and stitched together by American workers, bringing back American manufacturing. Find them at OriginMain.com. That's O-R-I-G-I-N-M-A-I-N-E.com. The EvoSec crew also uses and loves Origin Geese and supplements. Enter EvoSec10 for 10% off at checkout. That's E-V-O-S-E-C-1-0. EvoSec10 for 10% off. This includes Mulk, Discipline, and Joint Warfare, the Jocko labeled brands. If you would like to find us online, visit evosec.org for promotions, upcoming classes, and events. Please go on and sign up for our newsletter. We will be running periodic contests to win products from our sponsors. Also find us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at evosecusa. That's E-V-O-S-E-C USA. Lastly, we would love to hear from you. If you have questions, show topics, or comments, both good and bad, contact us at crew at evosec.org. That's C-R-E-W at evosec.org. Folks, we'd like to take a pause for a moment and give some gratitude to our supporters in the audience. Please do us a favor. If you're getting something out of the show, go to iTunes and provide a rating and review. Even if you don't use iTunes, you can do it from your computer. It helps us grow our audience and get the message out. Secondly, please share our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcast, Player FM, Spotify, and more. Share with a friend. We believe that there is life-saving information on this show. Our main mission is to educate and make safer all of our friends and family, and also to help create a more capable and civil society. Get the word out. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the show. Brian here, along with uh, Eric and Aaron Davis. How are you guys doing? Doing wonderful. Yep, doing great. Glad to be here. Man, we got another rock star on the show this week. Very, very happy to welcome Ernest Langdon to the show. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, guys. 
Oh man, it's a it's a pleasure to have you here. We've been looking forward to this. And for our audience uh, members that may not know about you like we do, can uh, you just give us a bit of a background? Give us, you know, maybe a, a minute or two about where where you came from and who you are now and how you got there. Oh wow, that's a that's a tough one. Um, uh, the interesting thing is, uh, and I'll give a little bit of story here. Hopefully, be good information. I've had uh, a multitude of people say to me, hey, I want to do what you do. (laughs) How do I get there? And uh, that's a little bit of a lead in because (laughs) uh, I had no idea I would be here doing what I'm doing now. And I love what I do. I love my job. I've got it, you know, literally uh, the the answer to that question is a little bit difficult because people I, I would used to go to used to go to a gym and a CrossFit gym that used to every day they go, they'd have a question, right? What's the question? What do you like this? Do you like that? Whatever. And the question one morning was, if you could have any job, what would it be? And I remember standing there going, I got it. I nailed it. Um, so the point is, Um, My background is military. I spent 12 years in the Marine Corps, which was just tremendous for me. And there's a lot of little details there. I had a um, a very unusual career in the Marine Corps. I started out as a heavy machine gunner. In my time, I was fairly uninformed. I really didn't know about reconnaissance or anything else. The only thing I knew about the Marine Corps was infantry. And in my mind, it was the place to be. And I joined the Marine Corps and you know, did, you know, did that and ended up, ended up becoming a scout sniper, ended up teaching at scout sniper school, ended up, was supposed to go teach at scout sniper school at Quantico, got to Quantico, and I had kind of made a little bit of a name for myself as a pistol shooter and at Camp Lejeune. I got snagged when I got to Quantico and immediately got to go teach at the HRP program. And when I say got to go teach, I mean, you're talking about a great job. I got to teach basically IDPA, if you will, hide behind cover, draw from concealment, and go to shooting schools. The Marine Corps sent me to just a ton of shooting schools because they realized they didn't know how to teach that stuff, defensive shooting, high-risk personnel shooting, if you will, to Marines. So they sent me to all these shooting schools, which was tremendous. Um, my, Without getting into all the details, I wanted to be in a force recon company. Um, I had taken the NDOC just prior to going to Quantico. That's a long backstory there. Everybody, many Marines have the same story that I have. The long and short of it is I fell into poop and came out smelling like roses is what happened over and over and over again. I take promotion pictures for staff star and I end up getting orders to recruiting duty. I basically weaseled my way out of that by saying I didn't have enough time on station. They get the, re, the monitors get mad at me and send me to Guantanamo Bay for a year on a company duty to finish out my time in the Marine Corps. I show up in Cuba and they go, Hey, you know, what are you doing here? Because I'm jump school qualified, another long story. And then they go, Oh, you should run our hostage rescue designated marketing program. And they send me back. I get to go to the advanced close quarter battle team member school. I get to go to the advanced sustainer program for hostage rescue stuff. I mean, just, you couldn't make it up literally that I got to do all the things that I got to do in the Marine Corps. I come out of the Marine Corps during my time at Quantico. I started competing. I started becoming a competitive shooter. I made my way to being a, a master class USPSA shooter. And back then, by the way, that was all there was. There was no GM back then. Um, that came kind of right at the end of this time period. Um, I get out. I'm looking for a job, right? I don't have any actual real civilian skills, if we're being honest, for what this, I did in the Marine Corps. And I ended up becoming a customer service guy at Beretta USA. And of course, I know the Beretta pistol really well. Um, About this time, I was a competitive shooter, but literally that year, IDPA comes out and says, we've got, you know, we're going to use production guns and we're going to draw from concealment and shoot behind cover and 
10 round mag capacity and all this kind of stuff. We're in the middle of the crime bill, by the way. And I was struggling trying to figure out how to get more bullets in a 40 caliber Beretta so I could keep shooting USPSA. That goes out the window. IDPA comes along and literally I wanted to stand up. I read the article. Walt Roush was the guy that wrote the article in Combat Handguns. And I read the article about uh, IDPA and I'm like, they made a sport specifically for me. This is perfect. And uh, those of you, some of you guys have literally have been, you know, around when I started competing. And it was it was literally the best story. It was accuracy focus, drawn from concealment, shooting from behind cover, all the things that I had spent years teaching people how to do and trying to perfect and do well. And it it just worked, you know, really well. So I, you know, won a bunch of matches. I did really well competitively. Um and, you know, started working on Berettas and there's several other jobs in the way. I consulted for SIG Arms for a couple of reasons and I ended up working in the robotics industry. And now I'm back to doing what I was doing 20 years ago, which is working on Berettas and teaching people how to shoot. There you go. Is that fast enough? <laughs> No, that that was perfect. That was perfect, Ernest, um, and, and very good explanation. And, and I did not know some of that regarding how how you really got thrust into IDPA. That's really interesting because, frankly, my first knowledge of you was from IDPA. I started IDPA back in ninety eight, ninety nine. I mean, almost at the inception. I I don't claim to be. Uh, the greatest a shooter I've done okay over the years, but but guys like myself definitely followed you and were inspired by you, mainly because of how awesome you were doing with the production gun, and you know the fact that you're run, you were running a DA essay, and and I don't want to emphasize that too much because you you might get tired of those questions because you've just proven so well. Um, how awesome you can run that gun and how your, um, let's so to speak, disciples have been running that pistol platform. So it, it's it's clearly a working platform. Now, um, th- that said, I want to circle back to your time as a Marine. First off, thank you so much for serving our great country. You know, it's gentlemen like you that, that help keep us free so thank you very much Artie, you're you're more than welcome i kind of laugh i get it i i think i don't want to screw the phrase up but i forget who it was that wrote a book thank you for my service is that right yes say that right yep. i mean i feel i feel that way to a very strong extent i mean the the benefits that i got from being in the marine corps from being a marine or just, you know, you can't count them. I don't even think you can quantify um, what I have received personally from my time as a Marine. So uh, I, people, you know, people say that, thank you for the service. And I want to go, eh, it was fun. <laughs> I mean, literally, I wouldn't be where I am if it wasn't for my time in the Marine Corps. So I owe a lot to the Marine Corps and my time in the Marine Corps. Well, Ernest, I will, will say the same thing regarding my time in the Army is is why I am at where I am at, if, if I can even claim any kind of success in my life, at least um, in my job. I'm extremely happy in what I do. And then I also am afforded the opportunity to start this second company with my brother and, and dear friend, Brian. So I really want to circle back to also... The, the Marine Corps is near and dear to me because my um, son, actually our only son, my wife and I have an only child, um, Nick Davis or Lance Corporal Davis is a Marine and he's stationed at Camp Lejeune and, and he passes Semper Fi to you. Well, tell him I said Semper Fi as well. Excellent. So can you name, uh, you can name one, you can name more. Can you name... Um, one of the biggest impacts that the Marine Corps had on you? Yeah, I, um, I've thought about that one a little bit. Uh, and there's there's several that are really important. When we talk about big impacts, the 
the first one is the the thing I'm most proud of. I mean, very few people, um, relatively speaking, uh, get to claim the title of being a Marine. And so that's the first one for sure. I mean, just, you know, it's not an easy task uh, to become a Marine and, you know, people make fun of them. I'll tell a quick story. Uh, I was having Cal Lamb as a friend of mine. I've known him for a long time since he was on active duty and, um, uh, long story short, we were sitting at breakfast one morning at SHOT Show kind of catching up and I like Kyle. We, again, we've always gotten really gotten along well and, uh, made some comment and a little bit of backstory. First of all, my time in the Marine Corps, I was only around basically the special operations community. So I was either around army snipers Rangers. I went to Ranger School in uh, Class 1091. Um, airborne guys, you know that kind of stuff. So I was only really around, you know, SF guys, that, those kind of guys. I was never around the regular army. And we're sitting at breakfast, and uh, and Kyle, you know, makes some joke. I said he, some joke about you know Jarhead, which I consider a term of endearment, if you will, but. He, you know, some joke about, you know, you Marine Jarhead, you know, trying to be you know, smart ass about Marines being stupid. And I said to Kyle, I said, hey, nice try, but I've been around the regular army. <laughs> and Kyle's like, hey, well, okay, whatever. He starts laughing because, and, what he, and then he says to me, he's like, you have to understand the, uh, and I'm not trying to talk bad about the army at all. Okay, but they have a much. There's no comparison, really, and I'm not saying that the Marine Corps is better than the Army. There's no comparison. the The Army puts more people in to the Army every year than the Marine Corps has in total. From from private to you know four star general. In the Marine Corps, the Army cycles that many new people into the Army every single year. So you can't really – it's not even fair to try to make a comparison because we need the Army. The Army is very important to us uh, as a surface, but they also – the reality – there's just the reality of the fact of how many people they have to put into the Army. And don't get me wrong. Some of the most intelligent people in the military I have ever dealt with are from the Army. From Ranger Regiment, Delta Force, those guys, I mean, they've got just unbelievable people. Even, you know, I've even dealt with 82nd Airborne guys. I mean, it doesn't matter where it is. They've got, they've got their levels of ability and capability are just far none. But when you get all the way down to the very, you know, the again, what was it some general said to me one time when we were standing there, and I forget who it was, but some guy came by and said something just literally like unbelievably stupid, some army guy. And I looked at him, and of course this was when I was on, I, I wasn't on active duty. And he looks at me, he goes, "Every army need every army needs their cannon fodder." <laughs> and I was like, "Really?" And again, I don't want to talk. I'm not trying to say bad, but you can't. The for me, that title of marine is important. Okay. And it probably sounds bad that uh, I feel that way. If I knew what I knew now, um, there's a pretty good chance that I would have uh, either – I've done something similar along the lines of what Mike Pannone did, which was, you know, I don't know who Mike Pannone is. I'm assuming you do. Roger. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And Mike, you talk about a guy who's done it all. We're talking about a guy who – Marine, I think regular uh, reconnaissance, force reconnaissance, gets out of the Marine Corps, goes in the Army, goes special forces, and then goes to the unit, Delta Force. I mean, really? What it was? What, what you do down? You know, fly jets? You know, freaking become an astronaut? I mean, where do you where do you where do you go from there? I mean, it was a phenomenal background. You can't even touch that. Um, but the number of guys that have left the Marine Corps. And then gone into Army Special Forces uh, or into the Ranger Regiment or other places that's, that's a fairly high number, uh, especially years ago before MARSOC was around and everything else. If you wanted to really do those kind of things, uh, the Army is the place to do it because they have 
uh, or at least historically speaking, have had the the true you know special operations capabilities and the funding to really make that work. Whereas the Marine Corps, you know, I always say the best thing about the Marine Corps is their history, and the worst thing about the board. I'm sorry, the best thing about the Marine Corps is their traditions. The worst thing about the Marine Corps is their traditions, and the Marine Corps gets wrapped up in. You know, we do more with less and we don't need the good stuff and, you know, those kind of things to 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 a default is what I would say. Um, to circle back to your question, and I kind of went on a complete tangent there. The, no, it's great. The other thing that I say is like you can't even quantify it. The discipline of what I was forced to endure and deal with as a young Marine is something that you can't get any other way as a 17, 18 year old young man. I was 18, I guess when I joined, but standing in formation in, in Paris Island, um, I'll never forget standing there and they have, you know, Paris Island, the big thing is the sand fleas. So, to me, that was what made it really difficult because when you're standing there and there's things crawling in your ears and up in your nose and they're, you know, they're having lunch and you're standing there at the position of attention and the drill instructor walks out and he looks at the whole platoon and he just stands there and he goes, let him eat because he knows you're getting eaten alive because he's getting eaten alive too, by the way. Um, the, you know, they're, they don't care who you are. Um, but he just stands there and looks at you and you have to stand there at the position of attention and just let these things crawl up in your nose and in your ears and all that. I remember that. And then I remember, you know, later, you know, as a scout sniper, you know, going on a stop and just laying there and knowing things were biting me, bugs crawling up places that you don't want them to be. And just know, I'm just going to have to stay here perfectly still. And you can hear your own heartbeat and you're trying to do, you know, be as still as you can. You can't replicate that level of learning discipline. And I don't think in any other way. And once you learn to manage that, everything else is it's just easy after that is my thing. So, so when you say, what did you get out of the Marine Corps? I can't even, I can't even get it all. The, the leadership, the, the watching, you know, phenomenal human beings the, showing you how to, be a better leader to be a better person uh all of those things it's just you can't even add it all up it's it's phenomenal i'm i'm so grateful for my time in the marine corps well ernest i think that i can kind of comment very uh very much from experience with your comment about the army and and what i will say is is that one of the proudest moments if not proudest moments of my life was seeing my um son graduate from boot camp. And and I will tell you that the Marine Corps is an incredible professional military force. I, I was deployed um, with the Marine Corps um, in a support role in Haiti in, in 04. And I was impressed with the, the, the professionalism was, was incredible. So I love the Marine Corps. Um, I love the Army too. I'm obviously an Army veteran. But I will tell you that the Army or the Marine Corps, or any of the services, folks out there that are are, are not um, military, the military is a microcosm of society, um, and the Army has a higher percentage of that. So, yeah, you're going to have some knuckleheads out there. I deal with them fairly often in my job, and you said something that I keyed in on. Um, how do I get your job? You know, I get asked that question all the time. And although my job is to support the the soldiers, um, sometimes I'm there because of their stupidity. And, and they're the ones that ask me <laughs> how to get my job because they're thinking, you know, hey, man, this, this guy's, you know, making this, that, or the other. And they think that I've got a cush job um, and that I've got it easy. Well, I don't for sure. And the first thing I, my answer to them is, well, first thing you need to do is you need to learn your job first. <laughs> so um but anyway that said again like you 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 hit it on the head is I have also worked with the most intelligent people um in my life I've met through the army um and back when I went to um you know I'm it was PLDC at the time for E5 
And the smartest dude I think I remember meeting in the Army was, was an Army Ranger in 75th. He was an incredible dude. I think that those of us that have been through some difficulty, and you most certainly have been through way more difficulty than I had in, in my military career. But what I will say is, is the experience of difficulty and pressure and all of that make us um, better people. Wouldn't you agree? Um, two things. First of all, the Marine Corps has their knuckleheads too. Don't get me wrong. And we're not a flawless surface. We do some stupid stuff and we have some guys make mis- mistakes and so, as does the Ranger Regiment and on and on and on. Right. I mean, I'm, I know those things happen, so I'm not trying to make it out like the Marine Corps is perfect. I'm just saying I'm proud of the Marine Corps and I'm proud of the fact that I chose the Marine Corps. Um, the, uh, to follow on what you say, that difficulty piece is, huge and i've had i've talked to young people several times when they find out that i'm a veteran find out i was in the marine corps and they say you know hey i'm thinking about going into the military and that's always my answers are always the same you should do it you won't regret it um i can't i really honestly think that the number of people that i've ever heard say i shouldn't have joined the military are i mean we're talking a handful at best. And yeah, they probably shouldn't have joined the military because they got themselves in trouble. They didn't do, you know, they, they were, they, but these guys were problems after they got out of the military too. You know, they ended up in jail and other kind of things. So you can't, you know, control yourself. You're going to have problems in the military, but the, in general, across the board, um, I feel like almost everybody would be served well. Uh, for for at least a short stint in the military, it's a tremendous, um, you know, social, uh, moral, all the building blocks that that young people need. Um, I think they get that compressed very very quickly from time in the military. Well, Brian here, Ernest, this lens. Uh it's good to kind of hear this backstory on you because it gives me a little more un- insight to the whole you know, 92 LTT thing and the, the, your passion for that firearm and was the 92, the only, or the M nine, the only, uh, pistol platform that you worked with when you were uh, training Marines? No, absolutely not. No, we not even close. Uh, so the, the reality is, uh, my experience with the Beretta in the military was probably similar to a lot of people's experience with the Beretta in the military is that, well, that's not really true. I We got the Berettas early on. So I joined the Marine Corps. I went to boot camp in late 85. So I think I, the first handgun fan fire I did for me, fire was with the 1911. Um, and the 1911s, and of course, the first time I got went on guard duty and was given a pistol and stuff like that was all 1911s. Um, and what a lot of people forget is the fact that the 1911s we had were absolute junk. I mean, they were trashed beyond belief. Um, they had not new 1911s had not been purchased since I forget what it is, but like 1945 or something like that. I mean, so these guns had been rebuilt ungodly amounts of times. And I remember when we did shoot them that they would l- literally come apart while you were shooting, you know, a bushing would break or something like that. The slide would go down range and, and these, you know, these, you know, the slide stop would break, you know, there's just things that would happen. And when I say the slide stop 10, if you will. Right. And the gun would just completely shut down. And, and it's not that the 1911 is a bad gun. I'm not trying to say anything, but the, the abuse that the military puts on a firearm is insurmountable. Um, so um, I had a lot of guns personally when I was on active duty. I had a Brownie high power. I had multiple Glocks. I had some, you know, several 1911s of various types, you know, the kind of thing. So I was a gun. I was always a gun guy, even when I was on active duty, um, which is not an easy thing to do, by the way, because the various regulations and stuff. But anyway, um, the point is I had, uh, people from various backgrounds that came to high risk personnel program to, to go to classes. So in our armory for the HRP program at Quantico, we had, um, 
We had SIGs of various types. We had, you know, MUSOC 45s, you know, 1911s, if you guys are not familiar with that. We had uh, Glocks of various types. We, you know, we had a lot of different guns in that armory in the early 90s that we would use to teach students. So, and I had students that would come from the Secret Service, the FBI, uh, one of, we used to get a lot of guys from the State Department, Mobile Security Division guys, um, uh, Diplomatic Security Division, I believe they call it. So, you know, we had DEA agents that would come through, uh, a lot of different agencies would come through that program when I was there. And so we would often use, try to use the guns that they had. They were their issue guns. So I've seen a lot of different uh, platforms, if you will. So I did have a lot of experience with the Beretta, but it was not by far the only gun that, uh, that I used. And when I was on active duty, um, I was a pretty big Glock fan. I mean, those that knew me back then would know I had several Glocks. Um, and, you know, went down that, you know, rode with the Glock a little bit because Glock did a tremendous job of kind of recruiting people, if you will. The GSSF and some other things were just, you know, tremendous um, recruiting tools, if you will, by the way they managed that whole thing. Um, but I also, you know, had several Glocks break on me too. Uh, I, had, I had a Glock 19 that I cracked the slide on. Um, I realized I cracked the, cracked the slide on it because I was shooting it at like drill around drills at like seven yards and the gun was literally hitting six, eight inches to the left. Um, and, you know, of course, initially blamed myself and then finally, you know, figured out that, hey, wait a minute, maybe something's wrong with the gun. Went back and right on the right side of the gun, you know, through the ejection port, the slide was cracked all the way through. So I'm not blaming Glock. It's just, Guns break. That's just what it is. But they're not perfection, if you will. So I was able to learn pretty early on that, you know, handguns are handguns, firearms are firearms. Everything breaks, uh, regardless of how good you think it is. And the uh, the other thing that I found out, we'll go back, circle back to the ninety two. Um, we had a. I remember when we sent a whole bunch of guns off for maintenance. So we had. I think we had 50, 40 or 50 M9s in our inventory in that armory. Um, and they ran great. We got a brand new batch of guns in. They ran great right up until we sent them off to, for maintenance. We sent them all off for depot maintenance. And when they came back, they were breaking. I mean, half of them wouldn't last a week before they would break. And I finally figured out there were several things that happened there. One of those of which is that they would take all the guns apart and clean them and then put them back together randomly. Oh. Yeah, so there was, you know, we had a slide that had, you know, a 1,000 rounds on it with a locking block that had 20,000 rounds on it with a barrel that had 10,000 rounds on it with it. You know, I mean, they were just all random. They would just refinish everything, put them back together, and send them right back out. And, you know, they... They would didn't last. Um, and fast forward, if you will, I remember having this conversation with a guy at Rings Thirty Seven, one of the Sephardic instructors. Um, he had went out and personally bought a regular Beretta ninety two, and he used that gun for like two years as an instructor at Rings Thirty Seven, and it just kept running. He goes, "Why is this gun not breaking? Do they make the civilian guns better than they do the M nines?" I'm like. No, and I had to sit down and break and break it down for him. It's like you got the gun as it was built from Beretta works great until someone starts messing with it, right? Until they they start taking it apart and mixing parts up and refinishing and slapping things back together. And by the way, no new recoil springs, no new springs at all, no nothing. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you another, you know, thing we had a. a I think it was a decocking lever or something that broke on a uh, on a ninety two, and uh, I was I was teaching a class to some of the CQB instructors at a Northwest Training Center. It's a place very near Blackwater where they teach uh, CQB to 
the fast companies in the Marine Corps and some of the other uh, units go to that school. I was teaching a class to him and a gun broke and they gave it to him in the armor and he came back down range and he walks up to me and he goes, I fixed that part. I was like, what part? He's like, that thing in the, that thing in the frame. I was like, what, what, what was broken? And he, you know, takes the slide off and he points to it. That thing, I replaced it. I was like, and I look at it and I can tell it's not a new part. And I go, where'd you get that part from? And he goes off another broken gun. And I'm like, no, you got to be kidding me. No wonder these guns, they don't have parts. They cannibalize parts off of other broken guns to make guns that will work. And they don't work for very long. Big surprise, you know. And, and I'm going to correlate this story to another uh, story. If you look at what happened with the, you guys remember when there was going to be an, I forget what they called it, the enhanced carbine program or something like that. But, you know, in the early days of the global war on terrorism, everybody was talking about how bad the M4 was. The M4 is a piece of crap. We need a piston driven system. I don't know if you guys remember this or not. I do. I do. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Oh, yeah. We got to have this. We need everybody needs 416s or they need the scar. Or they need whatever. There was a big, big, you know, argument there. And when they went to test, they finally went to test. They were like, OK, we got all these new, you know, these new fancy guns from LWRC. And by the way, great guns, right? You know, 416s, all this other kind of stuff. And then like, OK, we're going to run the test. And I, I don't know who it was, but, you know, they were they went to go pull guns and, you know, they were going to pull rack grade M4s to do the test with. And somebody was like, no, 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 time out. You obviously can't do this test with used guns. You need brand new M4s. So they got brand new M4 Colts from or M4s from Colt. Guess what? They ran great. <laughs> they did <laughs> just as good or better than the other guns that they had. And all of a sudden they're like. Oh, so maybe it's because, I mean, and you see where the whole story uh, uh, leads to. So anyway, long story short, I mean, I had a personal 92 uh, that was kind of on like my gun, if you will, that I would go to when I um, uh, was teaching at HRP. My M9 that would be my go-to demo gun or whatever. And that gun lasted for at least two years. I mean, it was fine, and I was shooting nothing but military hardball for it. Never broke a lock and block, slide never cracked, none of those kind of things. I shot the piss out of that gun, and it was fine. And so at the end of the day, a lot of the problems, you know, that we have with the M, that people have with the Beretta and the M9 are based around their experience with the military service, and those guns are just not properly maintained. And, oh, by the way, we're starting to see these same kind of problems where they're ugly heads with the, you know, some of the white soft teams and other guys that are carrying the Glocks. Because if you don't, it doesn't matter whose gun it is. If it's not maintained properly, you start cannibalizing parts from other used guns to, re, you know, to repair broken guns, you're, it's not going to fix the problem. You're going to keep having problems. And we're, we're already seeing these kind of problems rear their heads. So I'm not saying the Glock's a bad gun, but if you mistreat it and you don't take care of it, it's going to break and have, you know, next thing you know, it'll have a bad reputation. And hide and watch, this SIG 320 is, or whatever M17 is not immune from this either. Well, Ernest, if I can say one comment about uh, a uh, Glocks, for for instance, on what you were stating, and then I need to pass this back to Brian. Bottom line is, is that I have um, parts for all the higher failure items in the Glock, and I have a maintenance replacement time frame and or round count, and and I've stuck to it, and I've had no breakages, you know, and and I've had thousands of rounds, thousands and thousands of rounds through my seventeen for sure. And it runs like it's brand new. Sure. Properly maintained. It's amazing. Guns work really well. <laughs> From the major manufacturers, they're, they're remarkably reliable and durable. Brian, what you got? I just wanted to uh, ask on that because I knew the um, your start time was about the time that, that that became the adopted pistol. And uh, 
I knew that there was other things, but that is an interesting to get that uh, that spectrum of working with other departments and agencies because, yeah, that would be pretty much pointless to to train somebody on something they weren't going to use at all. How that that would not necessarily be beneficial. Obviously, it's pistol shooting, but um, we kind of feel the same way about training people when we do any training that you know we want to we want to teach at their level and what they're going to use and you know to bring them in and teach them how to use a revolver is unhelpful if they don't own a revolver, you know? So that's kind of, kind of like, that's, that's cool to see that. But it is, uh, I, I am intrigued by the whole, uh, custom LTT line because the Beretta is, I think for a long time, been a somewhat overlooked pistol. And with some of the stuff that I've been involved with and doing in recent years, that fixed and or slash rotating barrel, obviously it's not fixed, but, um, the non-tilting barrel um, for the use in suppression is also very cool because you don't need a booster or a Nielsen device, and you're not putting extra, you know, load or strain on the on the locking mechanism that way. So, do you uh, you have any experience with messing around with suppressors on those? Yeah, yeah. Well, I've, I've shot quite a few suppressed um, 92s on the PX4. It's, it's a little bit more of a problem because the barrel is rotating. You're either trying to unscrew the barrel or you're trying to over tighten the barrel when the gun fires. Gotcha. So the, the, the threaded barrels, there's other ways to do it, but the threaded barrels, the traditional you know mounting systems don't work well on the PX4. Um, but on the 92s, they work phenomenally well. I mean, there's there's I don't think that there's anything that runs a suppressor as well as a 92. Uh, because again, the barrel doesn't have to tilt, so you don't have the the big kid on the other end of the seesaw that's causing problems for you from a reliability standpoint. You don't need that, you know, booster to, to make things work. And so the 92 does extremely well uh, with suppressors. And, you know, it's, it's also the reason it's been so popular in the movies, by the way, um, is it works. So it's so reliable, especially with blanks and stuff like that, that it's a very popular gun from that standpoint. And we, used to joke when I worked at Beretta, was the best thing about a Beretta is it'll feed anything. And the worst thing about a Beretta is it'll feed anything. So it really creates its own problems. Man. And it'll keep working the re- when the recoil spring is completely dead. It'll keep working when it needs, horribly needs lubrication. And it kind of, it'll, it'll kind of wear itself out uh, because of its reliability when it's misused, if you will. So that's, uh, that is 100% true. Nice, nice. Well, I think Aaron's got something for you. Yeah, I I was going to say that for one thing, oh, about sometime last year, I took a really cool class um, from Spencer Keepers. And and of course, he had one of um, his Berettas that he got from you and and he he made sure that I shot it. So (laughs) it, it, it was an amazing pistol. And, you know, I'm definitely, as we are starting to instruct too, you know, like a lot of us tactical guys, it's not hard to get pulled into the Glock, um, you know, Glock only kind of thing. And I'll be honest, I have about seven Glocks and I have a Beretta Bobcat. (laughs) <laughs> and I'm telling you, those are all the pistols that I have. But but I'm I'm definitely interested in in one of your pistols. I've been looking at the CZs, some of the shadows too. But I, I'm I'm just looking forward to it. I, I mean, to me, it still seems like you know. I think some people would think you know it would be difficult to go back and forth between the platforms. But to me, it's probably like being a musician. You know. I can go back and forth between playing heavy rock and jazz. They're very, very, very different playing styles and, and even parts of your brain, but, but I can do it seamlessly. So I'm, I'm assuming it's kind of the same thing. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, I, uh, I don't have a problem uh, shooting striker fire guns, uh, and it, but the, the switching back and forth thing, um, it depends on the level of skill. I've switched back and forth and switched between different guns many, many times. Um, I've gone back and forth between striker fired guns and DASA guns. And I think at some point your brain figures that out pretty quickly and it 
doesn't it becomes a you know unconscious confidence or subconscious performance type thing where you don't really your your finger knows where it's going and what it's doing and it's not an insurmountable task um i would say that uh along those lines i would advocate for people to do that their main training gun or competition gun to be a similar platform to their carry gun um for the most part right i mean certain guys can do whatever they want if you're if you're a top one percent or you know top tenth of a percent or whatever you want so it doesn't matter they're going to be good with whatever you give them but for us mere mortals um switching between a striker fire gun and a dasa gun could be an issue and i've seen this play out a couple times for example that first shot you've got that long first shot pull um and if you carry and get and compete with not carry if you compete with and train with a dasa gun all the time and then you stick a striker fired gun in your pants when you leave the range you, you are kind of setting yourself up for a potential problem and, and the reason i say that's the case is you can you can be extremely aggressive, and one of the advantages of, to a DA gun or a DASA gun is how aggressive you can be to the trigger on that first shot. Um, meaning, getting on it and starting to you know put weight on it as you mount the gun and mount the sights. You can't do that with a striker fired gun. If you start getting aggressive to that trigger as you're cleaning things up, you, that gun's going to go bang before you need it to. And if you're subconscious is using used to being aggressive to the trigger i.e a you know a long double action trigger pull for the first shot because you shoot a cz shadow in competition all the time and you're shooting thirty thousand rounds a year in practice and then you strap on a glock 19 or a 365 as your carry gun i would argue that that could potentially cause you some problems if you ever have to really use your gun Sure. I'll tell you, I'll probably always be a Glock carrier, but I, as I am readying for, I've been trying to get ready for IDPA nationals, which of course that's kind of out the window right now, but I need to qualify for one thing for a, cause all my Glocks are modified, but I need to kind of kill a couple of birds with one stone and get a um, stock pistol would would one of your pistols be considered still stock, um, or would that be in the ESP realm? No, my the, the the elite LTTs are unless you got a carry bevel gun, they would all be considered um, stock service pistol. Oh, great! See, that's that's what I'm heading towards. Even even the, even like a full house gun with well, not full house, but a gun with MP3 finish and all the other kind of stuff. That's just a finish. So you're not you're not changing the configuration of the gun that's going to push you out of the SSP. So unless you add a mag guide or and that that's even questionable because that is a production part. You know the mag guide is on the uh, the Centurion that um, that Wilson Combat sells. So I don't even know. I'd have to actually ask if that was production legal or not because it's, it's technically it's a factory part. But the the Elite LTT with a trigger job and MP3 and all that other kind of stuff is falls into production class in production That's class awesome. or stock, stock service class. Yeah. Good deal. Yeah. That, like I said, that, that would help me get into a couple of other, um, of the divisions mm-hmm. because I believe you need to, you need to classify in four divisions. So now you've gone through your military service and then your competition, but you've, You've, of course, become really well known lately, of course, like we're talking about your company. What brought you into being a custom gun guy? Um, Well, it actually started because, uh, again, like I said, I was working for Beretta. Um, IDPA started. Uh, I wanted to, you know, a better trigger on my my Beretta, right? So I started... um, talking to the gunsmiths at Beretta and the armor, the guys that taught the armor schools and all that stuff and started tinkering and playing to try to improve the trigger pull on the 92. And uh, of course I had access to parts and all that stuff. So that was helpful. Um, But, you know, I figured out what 
you know, what springs would work and how we could improve the trigger and what needed to be polished and what actually made a difference and all of those things. So what basically happened was, you know, you go to a match, you shoot really well at the match and people want to go, especially if you're not shooting something they expect you to win. So if you're shooting a Glock 34 and you win the match, they go, well, of course, you know, I've got a Glock 34 too. And, you know, it's the same thing. When someone beats you with a DASA Beretta, which you're not supposed to be able to shoot well, which is a completely different conversation. We we'll go there later if you want. But people will go, well, let me see your gun. And I'm like, oh, here you go. And they would pull the trigger on and go, oh, wow, that's an amazing trigger. Um, how'd you do that? And they're like, well, yeah, you just polish some stuff and blah, blah, blah. Can you do that to my Beretta? Mm, I guess I can. Mm, you know, and it kind of went from there. And it started from people that I knew um, personally. I mean, and I became friends with Ken Hackathorn and Rob Hott and some of the, you know, the, the heavy hitters back then. Uh, next thing I knew, guys were sending me guns to do trigger work on. Um, and then shortly after that, I mean, I go to matches and people are like, hey, can you do a trigger job on my gun while I'm here at the match? And it just kind of evolved from there. Um, and that's, that's how, that's how it all started because there was nobody else really working on Berettas. You know, the, uh, Joyce Wilson, I built a gun for her. I mean, it's been a long time ago. It's probably been 15 years ago now that I built a gun for her. And, you know, that became one of the reasons that, uh, well, not one of those, Bill Wilson's always been a Beretta 92 fan. But it was one of the reasons I think that Bill Wilson called me and said, "Hey, why don't you come show us how you do that trigger work?" <laughs> you know, um, so it, there, you know, it was it was basically those kind of things kind of led me down the path, if you will. And then we just kept adding on and expanding from there. I'm actually looking at your site right now. There's a lot of cool stuff on here now. One one of the things that that we are pretty passionate about and and some people don't focus on it as much as they should is, is the carry belts that you carry the foundation belt. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll have to say that I have, my wife has one, my best friend has one. I've got several people, at least three or four other people that have purchased it. One of my good buddies literally texted me today and said, Mm -hmm. Hey, I just ordered my foundation belt from Langdon tactical. It should be here this week. Mm Mm-hmm. I mean, essentially, when, you know, when you're the guy that everybody asks gear questions and, you know, what kind of carry gear should I get? Well, it comes down to the belts and then I'll give them, you know, try and seem a little bit impartial and then say, well, there's these three or four really cool belts, but then there's this foundation belt. And then after several follow-up texts, you know, I basically, you know, threaten our friendship you know if they don't get that particular belt so <laughs> <laughs> but it's, were, were you involved with with edc not, to, yeah. to get that design not or? really i mean uh brian eastridge came up with that that whole thing the whole idea and he talked to me about it um but i i don't think i can claim i mean i said yeah you're right those are pro those are the problem and that sounds like a good answer but that would be the extent of my input there. I mean, he uh, he maybe changed some Velcro after we wore some Velcro out, something like that. But he, Brian Easter came up with the whole idea that it needs to be stiff in certain places and it needs to be flexible in other places. And the, you know, what we typically see is we either got a belt that's comfortable, but it's too flimsy, um, or we have a belt that's rigid all the way around and it holds the gun really well, but it's not comfortable at all. You know, you just wearing the thing all, all, all day is brutal. And, you know, the, the leather belts are great because you can cut a leather belt on a curve so that it kind of sits inward, if you will, and sits on your hips better. But leather belts are thick and they're squeaky and there's, you know, they don't have the adjustment and there's, there's various other things there. And they're expensive, right? Um, the EDC or the foundation belt, if you will, um, kind of solves a lot of those problems it's very minimalistic it's 
you know, it's super comfortable. It's flexible where it needs to be. It's rigid where it doesn't need to be. It gives you quite a bit of adjustment and micro adjustment because it's Velcro. So you can tighten it up just, you know, an eighth or a quarter inch if you want to, instead of a full half inch to the next buckle notch. So there's a lot of things about that belt that are really, really good. And I, again, I can't take credit for that. That was, that was Brian Eastridge that came up with that, started the company and, started started sewing belts and he came to us with it and we said sure we'll you know we'll distribute them and, and i don't know that we're doing brian you know justice we're the we're the sole provider of the belt we sell a lot of them we move quite a few of them um and i still think it is a relatively unknown product um uh, in the grand scheme of things and it should i mean i it's i just don't know if it's beatable from a comfort and doing what it does it 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 is the best belt that i know of yeah and and definitely we promote it i mean i i guarantee you that that a bunch of your orders come from the three of us recommending we appreciate that oh man we love them i think brian's got a question for you yeah i just uh follow up and then i'll move into a question but the uh Back on the 92 LTT, it is a, uh, forgot to mention earlier, it's it's cool to pull up Beretta's website and see your name on there and that they're giving you the credit on that because obviously you put the work in. But one thing that people may not realize that may have seen it or may just be hearing about it now, I could buy two of those in a dual Miami Classic holster setup and be wielding a pair of them before I could even scratch the surface of the entry price point of an STI. True. <laughs> That's true. That that is. I mean, <laughs> and I just bring out that Miami holster because that's what I always remember. Guys in the '80s carrying Paredes in those holsters. <laughs> I remember those. Sure. The STI thing is a really interesting point because uh, try not to make. I'm going to try to make this a quick story because I don't want us to run long. But the I had a friend of mine, and this is this is not a secret, but. It, uh, a pretty good friend of mine that is a uh, Randy Tweedy. He's a firearms instructor at LA Sheriff's out in California. And then a, another guy that's a friend of mine, he's actually on the SEB team out there. Um, I don't know if he wants to be named or not, but uh, both of them are, well, one of them, the SEB guy, is all in DASA. I mean, and a good chunk of the team that SEB team is because LA Sheriff's and LA. PD have a long history with the Beretta 92. Um, most of those guys kind of grew up with that gun. Um, but they are the one, the SEB guy is for sure a Beretta guy. I mean, he's all in. Um, and he's all in the ASA for a lot of good reasons. And I don't want to get into the details of things that have happened where he has seen the striker fired gun be a serious problem um, for you know, law enforcement guys, even well-trained law enforcement guys. But uh, Randy um, is a phenomenal, he can shoot anything. It doesn't matter what it is. Really good shooter, competitive shooter. Well, both of them were going to gun sight for what is the um, gun sight uh, alumni match or gun sight alumni shoot. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, but they have a gas match uh, so that they have at gun sight every year. And they have a one of the big events at this match is what's called the Cooper's Cup. So Jeff Cooper um, had a course of fire that he was his course of fire that he designed. And they put this, you go through this entire course of fire and it starts fairly close with turning targets, very short time limits. And it goes, it's everywhere. I think it's from three yards to 25 yards. I don't know the exact course of fire. But both of these guys have won the Cooper, uh, the Cooper's Cup in the past. Uh, and they both wanted to win the Cooper's Cup again. Uh, this was, it would have been year before last now, the 20, um, 2018. Um, so one of the guys was already going to shoot the Elite LTT because he loves Berettas and he was already made the decision, the SCB guy. The other, the other guy, Randy Tweedy, was 
all in STI. He had an STI Marauder, I think it is, with you know the rail, the cool guy tactical gun, phenomenal gun by the way, really fun gun to shoot, super accurate, all of the things that you would want. And in his mind, this is the ultimate gun for me to go win the Cooper Cup with, right? It's all the things that you would want, super accurate, great trigger, all of these other kind of things. So he's practicing for the Cooper Cup, right? He's running, he's, uh, I, if I remember correctly, he's kind of topping out a hundred, the score is like 145 or something like that on this, 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 uh, course of fire. That's the best he's ever shot. Um, he goes, he says, ah, oh, just for S and G, he had bought an elite from me, right. With a trigger job, just, ah, oh, you know, just for, you know, giggles, I'm going to pull this gun out and I'm going to shoot it in practice just to see how I do. First, out of the gate, out of the gate, shoots a 160. Best, his best time ever by 15 points. His best score ever by 15 points. Shoots it again, 160 again. He's like, you got to be kidding me. This doesn't make any sense whatsoever. The STI should be an easier gun for me to shoot for all logical, accountable reasons. By traditionally, the way we think about triggers the 1911 should be a better gun for this. He goes, he finally says, I shoot this gun better. He takes it to the Cooper cup, him and the other guys from SEB tie for the Cooper cup. They went, they win it. They tie it basically. And instead of having a shoot off, they decided since we're both from SEB, they're going to share the title. So they shared the title, both shooting elite LVTs. And the thing that's really hard, because he called me, he's like, Curtis, what? this makes no sense. I should not be shooting better with this gun than I am this other gun. And the thing that people don't understand, we get wrapped up. The two things we get wrapped up in is I can't have two different trigger pulls. I won't be able to shoot them well. Okay. Um, and then the, the second piece of it is um, that first shot, if I need to make a really precise one, I need a, a light, crisp trigger pull. It'll make me shoot better on the first shot. What happens, what in reality happens for most human beings is when you have that really light, nice, crisp first trigger pull, what happens is you, the goal is to get that gun up there as fast as you can, wait till you see the perfect sight picture because you need to be super precise and then go now. And guess what? Dang, my gun shoots a little left. Okay. We, we've all seen that movie. Um, and so when you have that great, crisp, super light trigger pull for that first shot, because that's the shot that gets us in trouble, for being honest. The first shot is the one that we make the mistake on, typically. Um, the meaning whether we shoot the gun when we don't want to, when we miss a shot that we shouldn't have missed. Once you learn to manage that DA trigger pull, and again, Randy grew up, shooting a, a Beretta from early days. So he already knows how to shoot a DA gun. What happens is you're forced to be aggressive on that first shot and be patient on that first shot. And when I mean patient, I'm not talking about taking a lot of time. I mean, being visual, visually patient for the sites to get to where they need to be. And we're talking about one second headshots at three yards on this course of fire. You have to shoot extremely fast from the holster to, to do well here. So it's not like they're taking their time. And the reality is for a lot of people, once they learn how to be aggressive to that first shot and how to pull through that DA trigger pull, it actually ends up being an, an advantage. And this is the why when you look at USPSA right now, it is dominated by DASA guns. Because once you get past that first shot, you get a way better trigger pull than you can put onto a striker fired gun. And it allows them to shoot extremely well. It doesn't mean that you and people say, well, what about Bob Vogel? And what about this? I mean, Bob could shoot anything. He is a phenomenal shooter and a phenomenal athlete and a, a work ethic that is beyond reproach. Okay. He works really hard at being as good as he's, he is. Um, if you, if for some reason he decided to stop shooting Glocks and wanted to shoot something else, it wouldn't matter what it was. He'd still be phenomenal. So you have to be really careful when you go down the, well, what about this guy shooting this gun? I personally believe for, for people that are willing to put in the time 
that are going to be way better with a traditional double action gun than they are with a striker fired gun. When you talk about serious high performance shooting. Man, what a what a great set of stories, um, Ernest. Really, really good stuff. What I will say, though, for the audience out there, I just want to give a little perspective. And I know you, you're not likely to talk about yourself, um, but I, what I want to remind the audience of in the authority that Ernest has is that uh, he's a, a 10-time national champion. Most of that was in IDPA and USPSA, correct, Ernest? Yeah, uh, ID, primarily IDPA. Um, I did win the first production nationals in 2000. Uh, it was kind of when I was in my heyday, if you will, or towards the end of my heyday. It was in 2000, but yeah, um, USPSA. I got a couple of you know state and regional championships on in USPSA as well. But well, I just wanted to make sure that that our audience knew that you you're bringing some authority to what you're saying. You know, also to um, world speed shoots as well. So. Um, anybody out there listening to Ernest, wondering if he's got any experience in competing, just wanted to bring that out. What I'll circle back to, we had some really good pre-show discussion that I think is worth getting into, but also pre-show emails and, and exchanges we had. Um, you spoke about a, a major pickup in business, and 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 I think... Um, Part of that's probably COVID-19 related. Um, can you kind of hit on some of that? You had some really good points earlier. Yeah, I know. I think, uh, yeah, we, I mean, our business is growing, right? And business has been really, really strong and steadily growing regardless. But I think we've definitely seen an uptick uh, in the last month, um, as has pretty much every uh, gun company, uh, farms, retailer, any of those. We're not a retailer, but... We've seen a significant increase, not a significant, but we have definitely seen an increase in business. And let's face it, we're not we're not selling, you know, you know, all the different guns that are on the market, right? You know, not the same kind of thing. We have a very specific niche market of people that want to come and buy stuff from us. But we've definitely seen an increase in business. So the uh, and the other thing I've talked to several. Uh, both real retailers and other businesses that are saying that there is a significant number of the people that are out there buying guns right now are first time gun owners. They just, this is the first gun they bought. Maybe it's the first handgun they bought. I mean, some of these guys may have a rifle or a shotgun, but it's either the first or the second gun that they have purchased. And my concern on that um, is that, you know, uh, not to be flippant, but all American men all like to think, they're good at three things. We, I mentioned this before. They think they can drive well. They think they can fornicate well, and they think they can shoot well. And the reality is, we're probably not nearly as good at all three as we like to think we are. <laughs> and when it comes to the the firearms piece of it, um, some people just think it's a rite of passage. I mean, they've got all these great instructors that have taught them how to shoot, like John Wayne and Mel Gibson, and you know Bruce Willis, and on and on and on. <laughs> all these. And the reality of it is they need to seek out training and they need to take this very seriously because we are no longer a gun society. People are not growing up with guns and being taught firearm safety and all these things. So I would highly recommend these young, uh, you know, new gun owners to go out and seek as much information as they can uh, to go out and actively pursue uh, training. Uh, at, at various levels and get as much as they can because not only from a you actually be able to use that gun to defend yourself standpoint but from a safety standpoint understanding good safe gun handling practices and not you know making mistakes is going to be huge because i you know, i have a fear that we're going to see an uptick in accidents because we got a bunch of people out there that have never driven a car and they just hopped in one and drove it off the lot. Right. And that's the example I would give with a firearm. They, you know, they don't own guns and now all of a sudden they're going to, just going to go buy one and, and that's their right as Americans. And I think it's great, but they need to seek out proper training and they need to make it a major emphasis for themselves uh, as they move forward and become, you know, a good responsible gun owner. And if I can add to that, um, Ernest, you know, we, and I know you're stating this as well, 
we welcome every single one of those, both uh, men, women, young men, young women, older as well, um, to to the fold. We want them in, and but just like you said, to double down, you need to seek out training. And frankly, there is an abundance of trainers out there. Any anywhere you're at in the United States now, you can likely find a high level of instruction close to you, but also be leery too. You need to make sure that you do your research. And that's one of the reasons why we, we try to educate folks through our show. But bottom line is, is we want all of those new shooters in the fold and, and we welcome them to, to, to seek out training. So what I would say is we would rather people buy a case of ammo, not even go to the gun range, Maybe they just go shoot, you know, 50 rounds to get maybe familiar, hopefully with some help. But better yet is if they seek out a level one course, a fundamentals course close to them and, you know, and not just waste that ammunition. You know, a thousand rounds can get you very far as long as you're willing to spend, you know, 200 to 450, 500 dollars max. I mean, that that's expensive for some, but find a level one course. Would you agree with that, Ernest? Absolutely. No, that's, that is critical. You can't, um, you know, getting good quality instruction, uh, early on is key because the, the thing that people need to understand is if they just think they're going to teach themselves and watch some YouTube, YouTube videos and stuff like that, if they develop bad habits out of the gate, poor grip, or trigger control, you know, bad gun handling skills, stuff like that. It's going to take twice as much effort to fix that stuff than it is than it's necessary. So if they get good quality instruction from a quality instructor that knows what they're doing right out of the gate, it's going to make that learning curve so much better and so much easier. And they're not going to have to fix bad habits or mistakes or problems and stuff. You know, I mean, I have, I have friends of mine that are you know, serious gun guys and they're, you know, have always kind of been gun guys, but they have little problems that they've developed over the years that are causing them very significant problems and them trying to move forward from a skill level standpoint. All right, Ernest, Aaron here. We're going to move into a lighter tone here as we start closing out the show. Sure. We call we call this the what's your favorite color section of the show. <laughs> so so and we'll make it quick cuz cuz you've spent a lot of time with us and we really appreciate it. Outside of shooting, now I'm going to take a few things off the table. Outside of shooting, self-defense, martial arts and I'm I we're not even talking about reading. What is it that you enjoy outside of all these things? Um, yeah, I, uh, uh, I mean, the reality is probably my relaxing time, if you will. The thing I'm downtime is I'm going to be um, either hanging out back by the fire pit, drinking a glass of wine with my wife, or sitting on the couch or the love seat and watching a movie, something like that. I mean, that's that would be the, the thing that I enjoy doing i mean i love my work i really enjoy what i do i get to design parts and play with guns and all that other kind of stuff so it's um th- those are you know spending time with my family and, and it's a little bit cliche but um uh, just you know kind of relaxing and uh, that's that's the kind of thing that we do we got to well it, it's cliche because it, it is when it gets down to it it is the most important time of our lives spending time Absolutely. with family for sure yep as i mentioned earlier i'm a musician so this is one of my favorite questions now any answers great we want to hear what are your three top bands or three favorite artists why don't you let us have it Whew, that's a rough one uh um, I thought about this because I have a pretty eclectic, uh, you know, um, music background, if you will. I'm not a musician, um, but I mean, my probably my favorite band of all time, band wise, would be uh, Rush. Um, I kind of grew up on Rush, and I'm a you know huge fan there. Of course, we just lost one here recently, but um, yes. the 
then I mean from there it goes it's like all over the place because I like a lot of like classic rock stuff and then you go back to Journey and Boston and you know uh, Queen you name it I love that kind of stuff but I'm I'm also when it comes to like when I'm working out I'm listening to pretty heavy stuff like uh, Drowning Pool and um, uh, Dio which is not actually new stuff but kind of I mean I listen to kind of metal heavy you know that kind of stuff when I'm working out Um, but I also you know I like some red hot chili peppers and you know stuff like that too so i'm all i'm all over, over the place when it comes to music that's a that's a tough one well the the main answer is it sounds like you're a big music fan so that that's great <laughs> yeah no i do i really do enjoy my music i've got but if you were to look at all the songs on my phone you'd be like dude make up your mind <laughs> No, you, you've made up your mind. You, you like all great music. <laughs> right. <laughs> Queen's right. That's another good one. I don't know if you guys remember. That's another Oh, fan. certainly. Certainly. <laughs> that, that, that's from my high school days for sure. Oh, Iron Maiden. That's another one. That's a freaking, there's another band that I still really enjoy music on. So. Die with your boots on. That's right. <laughs> listening to that just the other day <laughs> well hey uh i if if you're done there aaron i think we'll we'll probably start heading towards uh wrapping this because this has been a great yep. great session man and and before we go though um ernest let us where where's the best place to find you tell us where to find you uh, well, we uh, have a webpage, langdontactical.com. It's pretty easy to uh, track down. We're on Instagram and Facebook at Langdon Tactical as well. So any of those are easy ways for us to track us down. Um, uh, we've got a contact us email, at, you know, contact us at Langdon Tactical and sales at Langdon Tactical. So those are always good places if you've got specific questions, but those three venues, the web page, uh, of course, I've got a, a YouTube page as well with some videos up on if you want to go there. I've got a Langdon Tactical one, and then in the other one, the original one's uh, under Ernest Langdon. So. Nice, nice. And I imagine training is on pause at the moment. Yeah, we just had to cancel a class in, uh, for the first weekend in May because I didn't want to be held responsible for asking people to travel and go out in public, and we didn't know where it was going to go. I still have a class that's still scheduled for uh, first weekend in June in Ohio, and we're trying not to cancel that. We just, we just don't know what's going to happen. You know, they, I would like to believe you'll make that class. That's my I sure Sure, hope so. I, I want to be. I don't want to be flippant about this whole thing. Um, I want to take it seriously, but in my, you know, humble personal opinion, uninformed, uneducated, maybe it is, but the the math on this hysteria just does not match up. Doesn't add up in my mind. Yep, yep. Does not at all. Yep. I, I, we're with you. <laughs> yeah. We don't want to offend anyone, but um, we also. Understand the the reason for concern, but have trouble seeing uh, the legitimacy and the uh, amount of pain that's being caused. So anyway, like we'll, like shutting down the economy. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll try not Shut, to get too shutting down. <laughs> yeah, shutting down the economy, but the firearms industry. Yeah. I can't get ammo. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's that's from all your friends that uh, half of them bought toilet paper and the other half bought ammo. <laughs> The toilet paper zombies. Oh, yeah. Well, I know which one I'd rather have, and I, I think we're all in the same boat. So, yep. well, much, much appreciated having you on the show, man. And we will probably have you back and maybe be more specific about a topic because uh, this is uh, – we could we could do this for quite a bit longer because I really feel like we only got to about half of what we wanted to talk about, but uh, that, that just saves it for later. So very cool Perfect. spending the time with you, Ernest. Well, thanks for having me on, guys. I appreciate it, and uh, I enjoyed it, and we'll chat again soon. Dude, that was an awesome show. Uh, I really, you know, I knew Ernest was into the whole, you know, 
Beretta 92 platform, but I wasn't really sure why. And it was really cool getting to talk to him about that. And really like, like you brought up, um, the issues with the, the military weapons being, you know, potentially unreliable and how he really just, I mean, to throw a pun in there, shot it full of holes, man. Oh yeah. That, that was really cool to hear because you know, so often you run into some ex-military guy and, and he'll say, well, I'd rather have an AK-47 because they're way more reliable than the than the M4s we had. Well, th- that put to, you know, that killed that myth real quick. And, and we know that, um, you know, my BCMs, I'm sure, I mean, they're definitely higher end rifles, but I literally not a single malfunction in all three of my rifles except one time doing one of my roll around in the dirt classes i got a pebble in my bolt carrier group or or right in my chamber so that was not the rifle's fault literally my my main carbine not a single stoppage in thousands of rounds so man you like like you said, you have a you have a properly maintained, um, high quality, you know, manufactured um, gun. You're gonna run just fine. Yeah, yeah. No, there's definitely no no concern about the the reliability of those weapons. They they definitely were built to function and have been through a lot of revisions to get them where they are today. And of course, the parts and components that we have available today are even superior to what that was back what he was talking about back in those days. So really cool. Regarding his, his Berettas that he works on, I'll tell you what, that's one of the next things on my list. Um, I, I have not had a DASA gun since my old HK USP 40 caliber. Um, I, that was my first really nice pistol, but I got, I actually traded that for a Glock 27 and it was, it's been Glocks ever since. Yeah. Well, and bad on so, me for not realizing this, but I've been to his website and looked at what they have to offer. And up until this interview, I was under the assumption that they were doing those mods and like taking regular 92s. Beretta is releasing those from the factory with his name on them, modded. They're actually building them at the factory. So that is like, that is cool. The LTT is the, the Langdon tactical, you know, version of the 92. So it's the mods and upgrades that, that Ernest work with them on to, to provide that weapon. Very, very cool, man. Well, yeah, that I had no idea that was the case. So, I, yeah, I kind of thought he had he grabbed some Berettas and did mods on Which he, they do. Yeah, they absolutely cool. do. But yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's... Uh, but it, but it's a Langdon, um, Langdon pistol. Now, remember, um, we were texting back and forth, and I was saying I was having, having a hard time finding sights. Right. Man, he, his stock one already has some really great fiber optic sights yeah. and, and a real nice... Um, serrated rear so so when i get it i'm i'm gonna be good to go yeah it's uh, well you yeah and you can go straight to the uh to the beretta website and they show the elite ltt and it does have that nice fiber optic front and yeah like you said quite honestly i think the sites that come on it i don't think you're going to be disappointed yeah i i don't i just don't want um i don't want real real wide I don't want a real wide front side and a real wide notch in the back. Yeah. I've gotten used to those Dawsons on my Glock 17, so they kind of spoiled me. Hey, this is kind of a theme because I have some other gear stuff I wanted to talk about, you know, kind of change it up. We don't talk about gear that much on here. I'm kind of proud of that, but oh, yeah. need to talk But there about are definitely things then. that uh, make a huge difference for shooters, for sure. Oh, yeah. Well... So I'm going to go ahead and kick it off here, Brian. The first thing, I'm going to just get it out here. Um, I have not been disciplined enough, specifically in my workouts. As um, as you guys, as listeners, can probably hear, I'm not saying too much about my workouts because it's really just me being active. Uh, I'm being active and, and doing a lot more than your average you know, 40 plus year old, but 
last year we um, hosted Craig Douglas in Olympia, and, and before that, even though you're not really supposed to get geared up for it, Craig doesn't like you to, he wants you to come as you are. Hey, like he said in our interview with him, ECQC is often the hardest thing people ever do, and I can attest to that. So last year I worked pretty hard on my conditioning for that, but ever since I got done with that, I've let my workout slide. So I went ahead and grabbed my Discipline Equals Freedom Field Manual from Jocko Willink. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with it, but some of you aren't, and I just wanted to read the first two pages because I'll tell you what, these two pages will, will get you going in this book, and they pump me up for sure. This says, it's the way of discipline. People look for the shortcut, the hack. And if you came here looking for that, you won't find it. The shortcut is a lie. The hack doesn't get you there. And if you want to take the easy road, it won't take you to where you want to be. Stronger, smarter, faster, healthier, better, free. To reach goals and overcome obstacles and become the best version of you possible will not happen by itself. It will not happen cutting corners, taking shortcuts, or looking for the easy way. There is no easy way. There is only hard work. Late nights, early mornings, practice, rehearsal, repetition, study, sweat, blood, toil, frustration, and discipline. Discipline. There must be discipline. Discipline, the root of all good qualities, the driver of daily execution, the core principle that overcomes laziness and lethargy and excuses. Discipline defeats the infinite excuses that say, not today, not now, I need a rest. I will do it tomorrow. What's the hack? How do you become stronger, smarter, faster, healthier? How do you become better? How do you achieve true freedom? There is only one way, the way of discipline. So, again, that's the book Discipline Equals Freedom, Field Manual by Jocko Willink. Everyone should have that book. It, it's incredible. It's actually a quick read, but it's chocked full of encouragement and, and amazing information. Wouldn't you agree there, Brian? Absolutely. And I'll even expand on that a little bit. If you uh, One, you should have the book, but two, if you just need something to jack you up driving to work or you know on your way into the office, um, look up Akira the Dawn. Um, Akira the Dawn is a, a guy that does some lo-fi mix-up stuff, and uh, he's got a whole album of Jocko material. And you can find that stuff on YouTube whatnot. I, I downloaded it and paid because I want to support the artist. But uh, definitely uh, it, there's a lot of stuff from that field manual in that book, and it's, it's really impressive. So, yeah, definitely, definitely when I need to get, when I need to get pumped up. That's that's the book I reach for. Well, so I promise you guys you're going to hear more from me about my workouts. Now, I'm probably still not going to keep up with Brian and Eric, but I'm going to split the difference between what I'm doing now and what they're doing for sure. I'm at least aiming for that. So on to our drill of the week. I did not make the drill of the week because... Even better right now, I was able to go to my first IDPA match, the first one they've held in my town since the government locked down edicts. Now, I didn't place where I wanted, but I can tell you I shot the way I wanted. I was able to slow down. I shot more accurately. I was more involved in in my mental state and could really see what I needed to see and think about what I needed to think about and most of that was not executing the, the gun. It was about controlling my mental state while shooting. It wasn't perfect, but it was, it was a step in the right direction. So I, I had a lot of fun. Now, under lockdown here still, you know, I'm working from home, which I am actually enjoying. But Brian, can you guess what my EDC is when I, um, you know, make my commute in here to work? <laughs> Well, I'm going to guess that uh, 
it's Jesus's pistol, the Glock 19, when you're when you're commuting from home to home. Well, I'm I'm going to go even further. That's on my person, but another EDC item I've been having right next to me is an AR-15. Oh, nice, nice. You know, because who can EDC an AR-15 to their job, right? So now that I've I control the the office environment, there's no rules against AR-15s in this office building. <laughs> so um, today, just for fun, I grabbed quote my beater which it's not really a beater but it, it's it's a kind of a project gun that i have it's a bcm 14 and a half up or you know pin to 16 with kind of an old school quad rail from centurion arms um, but it's still a long one a 12 inch now one fun thing it has an old pre-band pre-1994 assault weapons band windham made windham main made bushmaster lower You know, um, Bushmaster is not usually thought of as the higher end gear, but you know what? This one is a nice one. Of course, it's before some of the some of the quality control issues came online. And more than anything, my wife bought me that pre-band rifle. You know, a couple of years into our marriage, and I had no idea she was going to buy it. So, you know, I'm I'm holding on to that lower, and actually. The upper still hangs out there in my um, my safe, but I thought that was pretty cool to pull that gun together. Oh yeah, the main thing is it is rattle canned um, desert camo, just like they do overseas, just for the fun of it. And I'm telling you, it's it's the legit Krylon paint that they nice. use, and and yeah, you use specific colors that they use. Um, it was fun. It turned out really nice so um, I'm kind of proud of that and I don't shoot it a lot but but I have it here with me now lastly guys we're going into summer and one thing that 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 drives me up the wall right now is my kids playing outside going in and out of the garage door and what do you think they do they leave the door unlocked the garage door open the door unlocked into the house now, apparently, I'm not going to cite any sources on this, but it's well known that a large portion or even most of home invasions or robberies happen because the person found an unlocked door. And, you know, I, I, I keep railing on my boys, and I jokingly say this, but it's half-joking. I say, guys, don't make me have to shoot someone tonight. Lock the daggum doors. So, but... Really, I'm just kind of encouraging everybody in the audience, make sure you're watching your kids in and out of the house and and even yourself. Make sure you're locking the door because um, you hear there's another good podcast called Self-Defense Gun Stories. And a lot of the time, those stories, they start out talking about an unlocked door. But Brian, I've bloviated a bit here, so why don't I pass it on to you? Oh, no. All good. Appreciate it, man. And that's... uh that's good stuff, and I've I have personally also taken to being a little more aware when I'm at home and uh, being a little more cautious about the doors. We had some uh, guys with their ring ring doorbells and stuff post some videos of guys going up and down the street checking houses, and they weren't willing to break in, but if it was unlocked, they were going to go ahead and help themselves, and that's. That's oh, a little yeah. scary, and this is also, I've got friends in law enforcement that talk about it, and it's the, it's the same thing with the car prowls. Um, they'll walk up and down a road, and they're not breaking into cars. They're just opening the ones that aren't locked and helping themselves, and it's, uh, it's interesting that that's how they choose to do that. But um, So for this week, I uh, did a, a, quite a fair amount of work um, on, the, on the cardio and workout stuff. I did... Uh, three CrossFit wads and four conditioning workouts. The conditioning workouts are only about 10 or 15 minutes of work that's uh, designed to, to just be like an additional strength builder. So it'll be like a, some kettlebell sets and maybe some Bulgarian split squats and then maybe some push presses, but a series of them in a, in a, in a fashion that's not timed, you know, to, to really work on strength and core. So it's, it's kind of different than when we do a CrossFit wad for people that are familiar with that. But we're still doing our gym challenge, our team challenge, and one of the additional um, things for the week was uh, you get an extra point 
for each person on your team if you did 200 pull-ups across the week. And I have a pull-up bar, but 200's a lot. And I probably did, you know, probably between 45 and 50 strict pull-ups. And then I did, uh, you know, th- there was an option for scaling. So I did a lot of ring rows, you know, and uh, some, some. there's another method of doing a, a ring row where you lay underneath like a kitchen table. And I did some of those too. But there's, uh, got all those done. And Saturday is a day where um, we have a workout, but they don't post it till the day of. And being, you know, the week or the month, excuse me, of uh, Memorial Day, we're getting ready to do Murph at the end of the month. And a lot of these workouts and programmings have been scheduled towards that. A lot of push-ups, a lot of pull-ups, a lot of squats, quite a bit of running as well. So the hero wad that was picked for Saturday happened to be Todd, and Todd starts with 72 pull-ups. Now, (laughs) they don't have to be strict. You can do kipping. But I saw that and I just I I was like, you got to be kidding me. I was I was a little I was a little irritated, actually, because I'd already done the 200 for the week. And I'm like, 72 more, Uh, you know, whatever. So I went ahead and did them. And, uh, you know, it took me about 11 and a half minutes to do that many. And I did kip them and I did them mostly in sets of three. Come down take a few seconds, three more, do a, you know, I can burn five or five or seven at a start, but I, I can't maintain those sets. So I broke down to where I was doing them three at a time and uh, about 60 in, I tore, um, took a big chunk out of my palm and that did not uh, feel real good. Bled a little bit, but I, uh, I wasn't going to quit either. I went ahead and finished them out. And, um, there's a bunch of other work in that workout too. I won't go through it all, but, uh, that was, uh, that was intense. So I did, you know, probably close to 300 pull-ups last week. And, uh, let me tell you, I'm feeling it this week. I'm a little, I'm a little achy, but, uh, back at it. (laughs) And if you ever, ever curious what the cure is for, uh, delayed onset muscle soreness, it's more exercise. (laughs) It will go away. (laughs) Just do more exercise. Just, just like drinking a beer first thing in the morning to cure a hangover. Hair the dog, buddy. (laughs) (laughs) So I did shoot, um, the five by five by five drill. And I did again, still, still doing it with my cert. I'm not live firing it. A little, little bummed about that. Um, But I was able to, um, I did it about three times and I was able to pull that off. And I think I only had a couple of misses. I didn't, I I did not shoot it perfect. I know that I did in fact have misses. Um, I did not, um, record all of my scores, but, um, I had no trouble cleaning the five seconds. Um, I did have trouble keeping the shots tight and, um, the device I'm using even will show you your hits. And uh, I had several that were nice and clean, but like Eric was talking about, you do this five times and you're going to, you're going to see some variance. And I got a little lazy a couple times. I got a little rushed a couple of times, but it really made me focus. And then uh, later in the week, I picked it back up again and I actually um, did it like strong hand only, weak hand only, um, picked up the, pistol off the floor and did it, uh, picked it up off the counter and did it, did some different, different variations on it. And that was kind of cool. Cause I was, uh, I was still able to get the shots off, but it, again, one of those just working different things. So yeah, good times. Well, I think we chewed a bunch of time. What do you got going on, Eric? Yeah. Thanks a lot, Brian, man. I saw that gouge in your hand from all the pull-ups your gym's been doing, man, that was crazy looked like you had scraped it across a a piece of metal or something and that was that was gnarly man so Aaron I think uh, you're beating up on yourself a little bit about your workouts man you know hearing you talk about ECQC and how good a shape you got in for that because I mean I always notice that you you come in really good shape for that maybe that's your why so so maybe you just need another why you know maybe I've been giving you a little bit of a hard time about getting a pull-up bar, maybe a squat rack. You know, maybe get that pull-up bar and and set some pull-up goals. Maybe that can be your new why. Just just a consideration, brother. Not giving you a hard time, man. Moving on to my accountability. I had three early morning workouts. 
with the limited equipment that we have here where I'm at right now, you know, I've had to get real, real creative. And Aaron, you mentioned the Jocko's death or discipline equals freedom field manual earlier. I started going back to that and, you know, Jocko's got some good variety in there for, you know, anything in calisthenics, strength movements, cardiovascular, what have you. There, there's a lot of good ideas in there. So so I've been pulling some out of that and just, you know, writing them down, you know, throughout a week, you know, write down three different workouts and it's given me something to go on and something to, again, be creative with. I've still been doing a bunch of jiu-jitsu solo drills. I will tell you this, guys. My inversion for guard retention and some of the different, you know, small guy jiu-jitsu that I've been talking about is better than it's ever been. So, again, I'm benefit. <clears throat> excuse me. Again, I'm benefiting from some of this COVID-19 stuff, but I'd rather be back on the regular mats for sure. I've been studying, continuing to study a lot of the videos that I downloaded from BJJ Fanatics. The Danaher back attack and straight jacket techniques is what I've been focusing on. The hand fighting and arm trapping, the way that he does it, it's caused me to think about doing more to the underhook side when I'm attacking the back. So that's been real cool learning that. So I can't wait to be able to apply it in a more live setting. And on that note about using videos and and studying for jiu-jitsu, I was pumped up. Just this morning, I heard Jocko and Echo Charles talking about jiu-jitsu and how their jiu-jitsu may or may not have been affected by COVID-19. And Jocko said, man, my jiu-jitsu is getting better. He said he's been studying and getting mental repetitions, which really pumped me up because anybody listening to our accountability over the last few weeks has heard me talk about watching video and that repetition that you get from seeing somebody else do something is is priceless. So hearing Jocko comment on that, that, uh, like I said, pumped me up. So reading-wise, I've been rereading Lenny Basham's book, With Winning in Mind, You know, that was prescribed to me many years ago by Mike Brown. We've talked about that on the show. I decided to reread it, and I'm getting so much out of it reading it a second time. So, yeah, get out there and get that book. That will enhance your mental game. Just like I was mentioning about video study and watching others as repetitions, there's so much you can gain from the mental game, and there's so much in that book that will help you out. So check that out, folks. So I think that does it for my accountability that pushes us into the drill of the week. So we did the Gila Hayes, Claude Werner version, that is, of the 5 by 5 just to give everybody a second week of doing it. But if you passed it last week from the lower eddy, we're going to do it from the holster this week. So again, that's the only change. I'll have the drill in the show notes so you can... Download the target and check out the exact the exact prescription. So that is at five yards, five inch circle in five seconds. And Claude Werner has us do that five times. Get out there and shoot the drill and let us know what you think of it. I think that does it for this week. We had an incredible time, as I always do with you guys and with Ernest. Until next time. Stay safe out there.